Hello friends, welcome back to the Passionpreneur series. I'm your host Brandy and let me tell you, you are in for a treat. I have actually been waiting, oh my gosh, three weeks now to interview our guest today. She is a firecracker. <laughs> I, can, I can I already guarantee you, you're going to laugh, you're going to be shocked, and you're going to learn so much from today's episode. Deb Gabor is our guest today. Hi, Deb. Hi. <laughs> I, wow, you're really excited. I do oh a lot of interviews. I'm, like so, you, I'm so excited. You must be the most excited host that I've that I probably have ever seen, at, <laughs> at least you know, during this time, that's for sure. Oh, we're just getting started, trust me. All right. <laughs> I don't know if it's actually written out there or not, but I am going to label you myself the queen of branding. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you know how I'm labeled out there? If you, if you dug way deep deep into my past, you would have discovered that I'm the brand dominatrix. Oh, I like that even better. <laughs> yeah, Deb, you just, we, okay, let me start over. I mean, I'm getting really excited now. So to quote a mentor of mine, you came into my orbit pretty recently and everything that I've just been researching and learned about you over the past few weeks has blown me away. I just, I love the way you communicate you teach branding. And one of the quotes from your site actually says, branding, sh you shouldn't need a PhD to understand branding. And I love that. I absolutely love that. This show, as you know, is really geared toward, I call them the baby entrepreneur. So there's solopreneurs, creativepreneurs, whatever you actually want to call them, but they're still really new at the game. And there's a lot they don't know and they're wearing all the hats. So if we can simplify, give them accessible tools and resources, then they can hit the ground running. And that's why I'm so excited to have you on the show because I know you are all about get to the point. <laughs> <laughs> Break it down and then go do the work. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, I'm I'm really excited to share, and I have a I have a passion for the babypreneurs, people who are starting up things. I I've been running a company since 2003, and I'm one of those people who's an accidental entrepreneur. So in many ways, I'm still kind of a babypreneur, even after doing it for so many years and being a CEO and and you know hiring so many people over the over my my past. I I just I love folks who are who are just getting started on this road, I will say that a lot of what I have to share about branding is stuff that I wish that I would have been more intentional and thoughtful about when I was starting my own company. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share with your audience some of those things so that maybe we can we can inspire them and, and give them a stable foundation so that they can grow their businesses in the way that they want to and achieve the potential that they want. Because I wish so much more about my own entrepreneurial career had been, had been more, more controlled and more managed and, and more driven and led by me. And branding is one of the things that's going to help your audience in, in amazing and incredible and immeasurable ways. I love it. So let's just dive in. Okay. <laughs> I don't have you all day, so I'm going to truly value this time and get as much as I can out of this. And I'm taking tons of notes and audience, I hope you are too. So why don't we just start with, you know, tell us a little bit about you, your background, how you got into all this. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, so I mentioned that I'm an accidental entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I, if you want just like a quick walk through my career, I, it probably makes sense for me to start with like what I went to college and thought I wanted to do and then how I ended up doing what I'm doing. Yeah. So um, I, I'm, originally from, I'm originally from the Midwest and I lived for a while on the East Coast and stuff and had a, had a very, uh, I'll call it like a very idyllic growing up process. My parents were very supportive of anything that my brother and I wanted to do. Very well educated people who worked really hard. Um, I'm also like, I'm the child of immigrants. And this is, this is important because um, I think that the immigrant experience in America defines a lot of how we end up as adults. Like the children of immigrants have a different experience of growing up than maybe people whose, whose families have, 
have been here, you know, for, for many, many years. So I, and, and this actually kind of goes into the story of how I got into branding. So I, I have these like weird Eastern European parents on my father's side, uh, Holocaust survivors also survived the Hungarian revolution, emigrated to the United States as refugees. You know, my father and my grandparents came to the U S in like in the, in the belly of a cruise ship. Like that was their only way to have passage to the United States. So, so if you can imagine people who came from, from this environment with lots and lots of scarcity, you know, once they established themselves here in the United States, um, and my grandparents were entrepreneurs, they actually owned a textile business back in Hungary. And, uh, you know, coming to the United States, they started out in these very, like, we'll call very entry level type jobs. They didn't speak English. They, you know, they, they weren't educated in the traditional American sense. Uh, but both my grandparents went to work in the textile industry. And my grandmother uh, was like a clerk and my grandfather worked on the loading dock. And my father, um, my grandparents put everything that they had into, into my father and his education. And my father very, very quickly learned English and uh, went to college and then went to graduate school, went to law school, became a very, very successful business person. And he worked for one of the largest companies in the world as an executive for his, basically his entire career. My mother, on the other hand, was the entrepreneurial person in my family. So my mom was the first female engineering student at the University of Cincinnati. And, oh my uh, you know, like at a time where women were not studying things like mathematics and engineering, like the STEM curriculum that we feel so strongly about for, for girls and everything. So my mom was like one of the first female STEM people and whatever. And so she had a successful, successful education in her undergraduate career. And then she went on and she took additional schooling and she became a CPA. And so I don't know how you go from engineering to CPA, but you know, it's a path. <laughs> But what's interesting about my mom is that she was the entrepreneur of the family and she, um, she's a little, I, I guess I'm a little bit like her because there was no company that could really contain her and her energy. Uh, just, you know, if you can imagine someone who's just incredibly visionary and, you know, always has a good idea, uh, endless amounts of energy wants to connect with other people, kind of the natural path is to go into business for yourself. So, so my mom was in business for herself and she ran a very successful thriving CPA practice where she worked with other businesses and helped elevate their businesses. And that's what I grew up around. Right. Um, and so like taking the combination of just like the sheer grit that comes from that immigrant story and, and then the weirdness of growing up with Eastern European parents, which meant things like we never ate out at restaurants. We didn't have like brand name clothes. Like I remember asking for as a gift, Levi's jeans so that I could have something that was brand name. The most exotic kinds of snack foods that we would have in our houses. Like while my friends were eating ho-hos and ding-dongs and stuff like that, we had saltine crackers, right? Um, and, and I lived this weird, so if you think about this, I lived this weird brandless existence where, I mean, I wasn't deprived of anything. I like, not at all. I mean, I had all of the advantages when I was growing up. I really did. And I had, you know, great, great education, great access to everything. My parents really, really emphasized experience over, over material things. I, I never wanted for anything. Like I have, I have to thank my parents for like just giving me like an excellent start in life. But I, I was living this weird brandless existence my entire life. It wasn't until literally, it wasn't until I got into high school that I realized that there was stuff like McDonald's and that there, you know, and that there was Coke and there was Pepsi and all this kind of stuff. Right. And, and my mind just completely lit up with all of these ideas. Then comes time for me to go to college. And when I went to college, like any good Jewish girl should, I either was going to be a lawyer or a doctor. And so I chose the doctor route. And then I, you know, I started off school. I'm like, oh, I'm going to be a pre-med major, which meant chemistry, zoology, double major, really hard classes, dissecting animals. And here's what I learned about myself. I have trouble with bodily fluids not just other people's, but my own. And um, I was like, this is not the path for me. 
so, your part. so you know, taking taking the sum total of all of those experiences i was like what am i really good at and what am i really bad at and i you know i'm the kid that in school like always got in trouble for like talking too much in class or or finishing my work before everybody else and then trying to engage all of the other people. And I was like, huh, maybe I should become a professional communicator, <laughs> right? Like playing to my strengths. I'm going to become a professional communicator. So I studied, I actually ended up studying broadcast journalism. journalism. So I studied journalism and political science, like as a d double major in my undergrad. Um, and, and through that experience, what I, what I learned was to like observe the world around me and behavior and messages and how do people interpret messages, how to send messages and things like that. And so my early career, when I first finished college, I actually worked as a journalist for a while and I couldn't make any money at that. Like it, it's really hard to make money as a journalist, especially in broadcast. And also, you know, I, I had been told many times that I had a face for radio and so, you know, my first broadcast job, I ran the assignment desk overnight at a television station in Cincinnati, Ohio. And every once in a while I got out, I got to report on a story in the middle of the night, which usually involved a car crash or a shooting or something like that. And I thought, I can't do this. So, so I was like, I need to find a job in the corporate world, A, that pays, B, is in Chicago or New York or LA, because I needed to get to a bigger market, and C, something that was going to... Uh, you know, sort of tickle this fancy that I had for for all things consumer behavior related and and brand related. Like I just had a lot of curiosity uh, about it because I think I was deprived of it as a young child. Mm -hmm. So I took my communications background and I took my education and my experience as a journalist and I went off to the big city and I worked for a huge company and I started out my rotations in this big company working in corporate communications, right? And corporate communications, as you know, has a lot of integration with marketing. Right. So I started to get that exposure to marketing. And then this was back in the day that when you, when you worked for a really big company, one of the things that they did for employee retention was they would pay for you to go to school. Like they would pay for you to get advanced degrees. And the only thing that you had to do in return is stay there for a certain amount of time. I was like, I'm gonna go get an F and MBA. And so that's, you know, that's how I got exposed to more of this kind of stuff. And then I ended up, you know, I worked for a com I worked for one of the biggest companies in the world. You know, they still exist. They're AT&T. And I actually worked in the Bell Labs side of the business. So this was an organization that just like innovated, mostly for innovation's sake, right? And so I got exposed to some of the greatest, most innovative thinkers in the world in the technology business. And so that sort of springboarded my career into the technology sector. And I grew up in the technology industry, like in different marketing roles. I worked in tech startups after that. And then um, on a boondoggle when my brother was living in Austin, Texas. So I was living in Chicago at the time. My brother was living in Austin, Texas. He said, you have to come down here. It's a really cool city. You need to come down here and visit me. And I thought, well, I don't have any money to go on a trip to Austin, Texas from Chicago. But it was February and it was really cold and it was really miserable. And I was like, you know what? Lots of tech companies in Austin, Texas. A lot of them are hiring. Why don't I put myself out there and see if I can get a recruiting trip? And so began my journey as the brand dominatrix. Right. So on a boondoggle, I, I accepted an interview at a company in Austin, Texas that happened to do brand research and consulting specifically for the technology industry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Like perfect opportunity. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll take this interview. I'll go to Austin, Texas. It's a one horse town, but I'll see what it's like. I want to go see my brother. Right. And take right. it. <laughs> I ended up falling in love with the company. I ended up falling in love with the city. I went back to Chicago. I packed up my baby and my husband and I was like, all right, we're moving to Austin, like put on your boots. Um, and so, so the first half of my career was I worked for other people. Oh, there goes the dog. Here they are. <laughs> Go Tessa May. Hold on one second. Let me close the door. No, no, no. Are you sitting? Like the trials and tribulations of working from home during COVID time. So we may have guests. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first half of my career was working for other people. And then the second half of my career, like when I moved to the agency side of the business, working first for this brand consulting and research firm in the tech industry, and then for a strategic communication and brand strategy firm, specifically for the technology industry, I was like, all right, I like this stuff. 
I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this. So I, I learned as much as I could from like being hands-on with clients and taking increasing leadership roles in those businesses. And then 2001 happened and you are, you are probably not old enough to remember like what it was like for business people directly after what happened on 9-11. But, um, it, you know, 9-11 happened September 11th and then like the whole world went haywire and, and I'm serious. Like when this COVID thing went down, when the WHO announced this is a global pandemic, I literally was having PTSD to 9-11 because the hardest thing of my entire career, and it still to this day is the hardest thing, was that at the, near the beginning of January, 2002, um, I got promoted to be like the senior vice president of the company that I was working at. And in the same day, I also had to lay off 72 people in the Austin office. Wait, and then the 72? next day, 72, 72 people. And then the next day mm -hmm. I had to fly to California and lay off as many people in the, in the Palo Alto office. And then I had to drive up to San Francisco and I had to lay off people in the San Francisco office. And then I had to fly to Cambridge the next day. Um, I started my own business so that I would never have to be in that situation again. And everything in my career has been about being the person in the driver's seat of my life and my career. And I say in the driver's seat of my life because like my, my life is so intertwined with what I do for my business that like I can't, I, I can't separate them. Like the, the two are, uh, you know, it, it very much is like work, life, family. They, they are all, they are all one there. I, it, it, what I do for a living is it's inside of me. It's a compulsion. I wrote about in my first book. I, I say that I'm a little bit like, like legendary basketball coach, John Wooden, he, you know, he driving down the mean streets of LA, he'd be like, pull over the car. And he'd see some kids shooting baskets and he would, he would go over and he would adjust their hand position and they'd be like, Hey, coach Wooden, thanks. And then, you know, he'd take off and people would ask him, why do you do that? And he said, cause it, cause I can't not do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that, that's kind of how my career has become. And so the last thing I'll say about that is that recently I was, I was made aware again of a quote, I think from Oprah who, who I love, like she is, you know, she is a model for me. She, you know, she said, you know, that you're in the right career if you'd be willing to do it for free. And yeah, you know, right now with this COVID time, I'm doing a lot of what I'm doing. I'm doing it for free. So, <laughs> <laughs> so is that a good, like, is that good background for you? That was amazing. That, okay. that just painted such a, a richer picture, you know, yeah. Um, and I'm actually, I'm really glad you, you brought up, you know, 2001, now what's going on? Because I just, I just had this conversation recently with a friend just saying how this is going to happen again, you know, in, in some different form, shape, version of it, it always happens. We always get knocked off our axes and having to rebuild and just make, make a decision, you know, from this point, are you going to go here? Or are you going to go here? Are you going to take, you know, the, the positive route or are you going to let what's happening now keep you stuck? And it, it, this word is extremely overused right now, but it's such a pivotal moment for mm -hmm. all of us. And I know, yeah, I, think, I think it's pivotal and it's really interesting. Like I, you know, I'm very, very involved in a, in a huge global community of entrepreneurs called entrepreneurs organization, mm -hmm. um, which like once these baby entrepreneurs grow up, these babypreneurs grow up and they're making well over a million dollars a year in revenue, then they can qualify to join this organization. But it's been, I will say that it's been this incredible like inspiration and support network to me, 14,000 members worldwide. I mean, I have friends all over the world who are running businesses like mine, and then they're running businesses like, you know, 30, 50, hundred million dollars. Um, that are businesses that they founded or they are the majority owners of. And, and one of the things that happened, like when, when we got knocked off our axis this time was, you know, this network of people, we all kind of, you know, we found our, we found our people. And, and what I learned was that there, there were two, there were two types of reactions. There were only two. There was the like lay down in the fetal position with your thumb in your mouth and cry, or there was the how do I reimagine myself and my business, not for this world, but for the post-pandemic world? Yes. 
Amen. <laughs> and um, the, the people who were in the reimagining camp are, are, are doing incredible things and already having global impact. And the thing that bonds all of these people together, there are a couple of things, and this is a huge takeaway. Um, there's a couple of things that, that really is, is common. They're common attributes across all of these people, the ones who are reimagining and, and are already having impact and are already making the world a better place. The things that they have are, they are doing everything through the lens of helping. Helping and not selling, they are generously sharing their expertise with other people without obligation of anything in return. Right. So, so they're the people like I'm doing this, like I I'm out there. I am, I am speaking to people. Uh, I am giving away my expertise for free. I am participating in, uh, you know, virtual events where, where I, I get paid nothing. Um, I'm having my own, virtual events to teach people new things and introduce them to new people, thought leaders, other authors, other speakers like me, people who, who do what I do with the sole purpose of elevating them and giving to them. And, and then, you know, the third thing is that these people are doing it with this incredible humility. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've been in, like, I have goosebumps just thinking about yeah. it. It could be air conditioning or I'm triggered. I don't know. Um, but it, you know, when I, when I think about the two types of entrepreneurs, really the ones who are reimagining their businesses and their lives for, for the post pandemic world, they swung into action very quickly. They gave themselves the opportunity to feel the feels because we need to do that too. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, they swung into action very, very quickly, you know, doing things through this lens of helping versus selling without obligation, sharing generously their expertise and what they have to give the world for free. Because, you know, frankly, a lot of us are very, very fortunate and we've been gifted with this opportunity to help other people. And they're doing it with incredible humility and not asking for recognition from other people. And I've been incredibly inspired by that. Like there are people who are among my friends who have started like global movements out of their, like I'm in my bedroom, like they're working in their closet or in their den or at their kitchen table or, or on their couch or whatever. So um, that's, been, that's been a huge recognition that I've had over the past couple of weeks. I love that. That's so inspiring. It really, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. It's so cool. <laughs> so let's get into the, 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 book, the books you've written. Mm -hmm. Wow. You, you want to talk about, about the sex book first? Yes. <laughs> That's what everybody likes to talk about first. They're like, yeah, let's talk about sex. Okay, so, so everybody who's watching this, like this book is not about sex, okay? Far from My it. parents are so proud that I'm now the sex lady, that I've written a book that has the words sex and laid. Are you bleeping this out? Sex no, not laid. at all. <laughs> at first glance, I was totally like, okay, what did like, what I just sign up for? Oh, okay, I yeah. get it now. <laughs> But you love it, right? I love it. I, I love it's both. The Bible. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> the the title of the book is "Branding as Sex: Get Your Customer Laid and Sell the Hell Out of Anything." My I thought my publisher was going to only sell this book like wrapped in brown paper, um, but believe it or don't, you know, with a title like that and and with a cover that looks like it does, the book flies off the shelves. So it's a it's a good book. A lot of people like it. It's a how to book. It's not a how to have sex but it's a how to get people laid using your brand. That's what the book is about. <laughs> so, so how much of this book is what you mentioned earlier, the things that you wish you had known or had implemented in your business when you first started? Um, I, I would say that this book is exactly that. So this book is the how to of creating the strategic foundation of your brand. This is uh, no matter what stage you are at as an entrepreneur, whether you are pre-start or you're already out there and you're moving and shaking, using the lessons and the process in this book will help you take your brand to the next level, whatever level that is. So if, if you're new and you want to get started and you want to have the clarity that's going to set you up for long-term success, 
this book will help you. If you have already started a business and maybe you've plateaued or you're trying to figure out what is the, what is the next phase for me? What is the next frontier? What is the next product? Um, how do I scale? This book will help you be poised to figure out how you can scale and how you can do it in a manageable way that is more profitable and, and frankly, more fun for your business. If you are a, mat a mature business, if you're like a gigantic multinational corporation, which that's what most of my clients are, this book will show you how to be more focused and more profitable with your brand. So this is a book, it's kind of for everybody. Yeah. Um, and it has applicability at every one of those stages because the methodology is the methodology is the methodology. It doesn't matter what stage you are as a business. And it doesn't matter if you're a direct to consumer brand or a business to business brand. It doesn't matter if you are a luxury brand or a down market brand. It does not matter if you are um, if you are selling a product or if you're selling a service or if you are selling yourself, which I know many solopreneurs, many, you know, babypreneurs, like at this point, they really are selling themselves, right? You hear that? He agrees. <laughs> okay. This is what it's about, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Oh my goodness. She like, she's so cute. She's so, so, so cute. Come and she, come here. Come here. Oh my goodness. That's Tessa May. It's Tessa May dog. Oh, they have the best names. <laughs> Tessa May. Yes. There's a cat over here. Coco Kitty. We have another cat. Her name is Beyonce. Um, and then we have, uh, then we have Comet, who's my 15 year old Australian cattle dog. So oh anyway, I, I told you we were going to have a special guest. <laughs> I love it. I love you know it. What? I've seen people on NBC news have their dogs come into the room. So yes, exactly. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. The more the merrier. <laughs> yep. All right. You stop. All right. Come here. Sit down. Sit down, fluffy butt. All right. There we go. <laughs> so branding and sex really is a bible i mean it, it's one of the it's the book that will carry you throughout the lifespan of your business yeah i so, have so i've been telling people right now even mature businesses uh, d this is a reminder there there is no going back to the way things were before everything has changed and it has changed forever it is time for every single person to look at their brand through the lens of this new this new post pandemic world right? Nothing will ever be the same. And, and I was telling people like, I, when did I start? I guess the day the WHO declared that we were having a global pandemic is when I sent everybody home from the office. We haven't been home since. I told everybody then, I'm like, every brand in the world is in crisis right now, whether they like it or not, whether they know it or not, they're all in crisis because everything about the way that we do business has completely changed and it has changed forever. So initially when I was out there speaking to people, I was telling them, don't F up your brand right? These are the things you need to do to ensure that your brand can survive this crisis. Now, like what, we're like eight or nine weeks into it. I'm going on week nine of, of working from home. Um, now the conversation really is about how do you reimagine your brand for the post-pandemic world? And it is going to require you to think about what are your core values and beliefs as an individual and as a brand, and how are you going to use that to attract people to you in the future, knowing that we are all permanently changed, right. right? And so the brand doesn't change, but the way that you go about articulating the brand changes. So even if you did this work before, you have to do this work again so that you can be relevant and resonant with the right people. In some ways, is our core customer going to be, is, is, is our core customer different or going to be different after this as well? Or should we be thinking about who now are we targeting? I think that brands should be thinking about who, again, who is the, the most ideal customer for my brand. I think in many respects, who that human being is hasn't changed, but that human being has changed. Mm. Does that make sense what I'm it saying? Does. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, think about it this way. Like I, I know that I have changed. I, I have changed. I have changed a great deal. Like uh, before this, I had a huge life. And what I mean by a huge life, I literally spend all of my time 
traveling all over the world, speaking to groups of people, sharing my <laughs> sharing my dogs. I'm gonna close the door right here. <laughs> That's Amazon, I'm sure. Oh my god. <laughs> You know, the last time I did this, it was my booze order, and that was really, really embarrassing. <laughs> hold, hold on, I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute you while I. Okay, I'm back. Doesn't it sound quiet back here? Oh, it's perfect. <laughs> did you lock them out? Uh, I, no, I locked them in. With me. <laughs> I figured there's 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 less to, to distract them if they're in the room with me. They, they'll know that I'm safe, right? Right. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, Tessa May. Tessa, Tessa May dog, come here. Come here. Come here. <laughs> Tessa May dog, you must have stopped. Shh. Lots of okay. do. <laughs> okay. All right. It's fine. It's totally fine, Tessa May. It's, it's, really, it's really fine. Here, you want to you get on my lap? All right. <laughs> This, maybe this will make her feel better. Tessa May is totally fine. Okay, say hi. Say hi to Brandy. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so okay. So I was saying this very, very deep, important thing, which is the ideal customer probably doesn't change, but the human being, the human being, is forever changed. And I was explaining that I used to live this very big life. Where I, I had, before all of this happened, I was getting ready to take off on like a six month speaking tour where I was literally going to be on every continent except for Antarctica. And I don't even know if you consider them a continent, but I wasn't going there and I'm definitely not going there now. Um, but that's what I was getting ready to do. And, uh, you know, it was very exciting and, and it was going to be global travel and I was going to come home a day here and a day there and go do all this kind of stuff. And then here we were bam, everything completely gone. And then, um, you, you know, this very big life that used to involve things like travel and used to involve big events and speaking engagements and media and all this kind of fun stuff uh, now involves me sitting in front of, like, I'm in my bedroom right now with, like, I'm locked in a room with my dogs. I have my only social interaction it takes place through Zoom. I go outside once a day and I go trail running or hiking. And the most exciting thing to happen to me personally in the last couple of weeks was on a hike the other day in this area where I go hiking, there, there's, there's this rumor that there's, a, um, there's an abandoned VW bus somewhere in the woods. And there's also a rumor of this this system of trails called the switchback party. And I'd only ever heard rumors about it. And I'd only ever seen like, you know, trail maps sort of referencing them, but I had never found it myself. And the other day I was out there and I didn't just find the switchback party. I also found the abandoned VW bus. And, and so this is evidence of how, how changed a human being I am. And, and the takeaway for everybody is that like your customers are changing also. Yeah. That particular incident was, was among the most exciting and sort of pride infusing experiences that I've had in two months. The, the, it captured my imagination because I was like, Vita, you bus, like, what's it doing here in the woods? I literally, this is up on a mountain. It's like falling down the mountain and it's in these trees. And it's, I mean, it's like, it's sort of creepy looking, but it's also like fascinating. And like, it engaged my imagination in this really incredible way. But it also, it gave me this incredible sense of delight. Mm -hmm. And it gave me, it gave me a feeling of accomplishment and all that. It, so, so the reason that I share this is that, that is something that probably would have like been on my radar for a second and gone. Mm. And, and now I'm, I'm finding more appreciation in the smaller things. I started break, baking sourdough bread. And let me tell you, I don't recommend it to anybody who's never had kids because it's more responsibility than having a newborn baby. Um, but like doing stuff like that, like just the simplicity and the return to maybe the simpler things you know, less media, less hustle and bustle, more time, like actually being a, he a human being rather than a human doing. So like our customers have changed 
drastically, our message to them through our brand has to change to reflect how they've been changed. And that's the big thing that brands need to recognize. That's why brands like need to stop sending the we are all in this together email. They need to stop with that television commercial, which all of them are doing that starts with the tinkly piano music and then shows the, shows the frontline workers and then shows the people on their balconies clapping for the medical professionals. And then we are all in this together. If you need a new machete or a floor lamp or an Aston Martin, we've got you, right? It doesn't matter, but like it's inauthentic. And when you have nothing to say, don't say the same thing that everybody else is saying, right? And, and I think that we're seeing a lot of that. And the dog is still barking. That is so powerful. I mean, I, I definitely hear you with, with the commercials. I've seen a ton of them. They all look and They're indistinguishable. Down. Yeah, the same. Um, I am surprised though by what you just said, where if you don't have anything to say, just be quiet essentially because i feel like at least for, for for myself and my business immediately i felt like okay i need i need to be louder i need to get out there i need to say something i'm not sure what it is but something <laughs> well and if you need to say something like if you feel like you need to say something if you're like really i need to say something you have to say that through a lens of helping and not selling you need to not be overbearing and at the you know what if you don't know what to say you ask right mm -hmm. so you know, brands are providing leadership right now. In the lack of true leadership in all of these different government entities that are supposed to be taking care of us, and we, like, I don't, I don't want to have a political conversation, but there is a lack of leadership right now. Yes. In the lack of leadership and the lack of clarity and truth and, and, you know, precision, people are making up terrifying scenarios on their own. If you have nothing to say, it's okay for you to be quiet you can't be silent forever. You do need to say something. We've seen a lot of evidence of brands that haven't said anything soon enough and they've killed their brands. Likewise, when you say something that is the same as everybody else's, it gets drowned out. But the best thing that a brand can do is ask, right? Mm -hmm. So Brandy, if you're stuck on what to say to clients and you don't know what to say to them and whatever, I know that I was overwhelmed when this first happened. I was overwhelmed with all of the content and all of the people who were out there trying to share with me, like, you need this, you need this, you need this. And I was like, I was on like five mind, mind, what do they call it? Like a uh, mind meld. What is it called? Mind uh, up here. Yeah, whatever, whatever it is, like masterminds. I'd be like oh, on five yes. masterminds a day or I'm like on 10 conference calls or, or Zooms a day trying to like learn, like what is the stuff that I'm going to need in order to, to, you know, be able to survive the the covidiots and whatever and and i was like in a state of analysis paralysis because i couldn't make any sense of it um the 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 best communication that i ever was on the receiving end of this through this entire thing was when the brands that i cared about actually asked me how are you are you okay what do, what are you doing how can i help you what are you not getting right now right and so that's what I've been advising. I mean, I'm in uh, my second book, Irrational Loyalty, is a book about crisis, right? It's called Building a Brand That Thrives in Turbulent Times. Like, if there were ever a book that foreshadowed this, Perfect. right? Seriously. Um, yeah, right. I did not, I promise I did not bring this on. And and my next book is about is about the robots. It's about AI. So, um, you know, when the when the AI revolution takes over marketing, uh, so I'm foreshadowing that. That's about you know that's going to happen like you know, that book is going to come out next year. And then the, then the following year is when the robots are going to take over. So just, I said it here. I said it right here on this show. You, um, but, yeah. But, <laughs> but this, but this idea of, of, you know, communication in a crisis, when people don't have information, they fill in the most terrifying things themselves. They make up their own frightening stories. And if you have nothing to say and you're not comfortable in the stillness of nothing to say, the most effective thing you can do is ask because it, 
what's important about your brand is not your message. What's important about your brand is what's inside the brand, which is the values and beliefs of the people behind the brand, right? Your brand is a magnet. You use that to draw to you people who share your values and beliefs. What better way to attract people with the magnet of your brand than just asking people if they're okay, you know? So I've been advising people and I've been advising brands through this crisis the entire time. And there's been like a story arc that's sort of interesting. At the beginning, it was like, don't screw up your brand. Like, don't try to sell too much. Don't try to say too much. Certainly don't, uh, you, you know, don't say the wrong thing. Like I, I, I saw things at the beginning uh, just through marketing automation. I, I got an automated marketing email from a retailer that I had purchased from uh, maybe two years ago, which they sent me an email advertising a friends and family sale. And the, the subject line of the email was staycation is better than vacation. I was like, this is anything but a staycation folks, right? Then there was the COVID-19 coupon code that I received from someone, right? Are you kidding me? So, so at the beginning it was like, stop doing this stuff that's gonna screw up your brand. Then it evolved like probably about a month in, it evolved to, all right, it is time to communicate with your community do it using these rules. First rule, focus on your own community first, because now is not the time for rampant customer acquisition. Nobody wants to be sold to right now. Like there's a local car dealer here in Austin, Texas, that's trying like really, really hard to sell cars. They're like, here's what we're doing for the COVID time. We're making it possible for you to buy a brand new car online. Wow. That's not what people want to hear right? Um, so focus on your own community first and do it through a lens of helping versus selling. Figure out like what are three things that you can offer to your existing customers to help them at this time. It will bond you to them. It will bond them to you. Then, you know, fast forward a couple of weeks. Now we've really gotten into the meat of brand reimagination, right? So like from about week four until now, this is where I'm having the conversation with brands about it is time for you to imagine your future as a brand post pandemic. The human beings that are part of your brand have changed forever. How are you, how are you going to change? So um, I, and then here's, here's the part of it that we haven't yet seen. That is the part of the story arc because we, we have not even seen the climax is when we start sending people back to work, when we start sending consumers back into the world to patronize all of our businesses and the dangers, like the physical dangers associated with that. Like what if you're the brand that unfortunately someone, a customer, an employee, a, a, a vendor gets sick from patronizing your business or experiencing your brand like we have not yet even barely scratched the surface of the brand disaster that looms out there wow yeah. I, I hadn't even thought of that I know yeah. like yeah so you know my my publicist she's like what should we be pitching to the media right now I said you should be pitching nothing to the media right now because we're going to have plenty to talk about in a couple of weeks as as we start getting into these later phases of opening up the economy again, because we are going to have like, what's the potential damage to a brand of, let's say you're a retail store and you're like, you know what? I don't want to open up right now because I don't want to put my employees and my customers in danger. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? right? If you don't open up right now, then you're against getting the economy back to work. If you do open up right now, you're putting people in danger, right? So right. brand disaster looming. What if you're the employer? Um, what if you're the employer who has the employees who sue you because you are not providing adequate protection for them while they're in the workplace? Let me tell you, my employees ask me every single day, Deb, when, were we, when are we going to go back to the office? And I said, I can't control any of you all and your stupid lifestyles outside of the workplace. So we are not going to go back to the office until I feel safe. And I, there is no guarantee that the janitors that clean our office building are, are not spreading COVID. There are no guarantees that, um, like, I, I don't want to be responsible for taking your temperature when you walk in the, the office. I personally find having any kind of physical interaction with you that involves me, like, investigating your, your physical 
body to be above and beyond what an employer should do, right? Yes. And, and so when, when I talk about looming brand disaster, like all of that puts every brand at risk, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Even if you don't have a physical space where you're operating your business, like where, like, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? How are you, right. you know, all these things. I think about my hairdresser, right? You know, Texas is going to open up beauty shops on May the 8th. She told me, she's like, girl, I'm not going to open. Like I, I, I'm not, I just like, I'm not ready. I don't feel comfortable. Um, I, I don't want to be responsible. And so I'm like, I, I'm at least four weeks overdue for a root tough touch up and a haircut. And, and in my mind, what I'm mulling over is, am I going to go find a new hairdresser or am I going to live like this for another four weeks? Right. And what is the impact to her brand when people are unable to use it? So, so that like, if anybody's taking away anything besides my, my silly barking dogs here, it's that we, we have not even started to scratch the surface of the looming crisis for brands. Wow. Yeah. And so there's, there's never been a better time to think about these things than like right now when we're living it, right? Absolutely. So two questions come to mind. What, so thinking about the future, what's to come, what that looks like, what are some of the conversations we can start having, having with our current customers, letting them know how we feel and where we're coming from with them in mind? And then on the other side, what conversations are we having with our team? Since we are the, the leadership team for, 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 for the business. Yeah. Um, so the first question about like, what kinds of conversations should we, ha should we be having with our customers? It, the it, two things that I, that I recommend to folks is first, Get clear on what your core purpose and core values are as a brand, whether you're a solopreneur or you run a big company or you run a mid-sized company like what I have. Like it's a worthwhile endeavor to go back and remember like, why are we on this earth? Why are we doing what we're doing? Because every business should have a purpose beyond we're in business to make money. Right. Okay. So I, you know, I run a brand strategy firm and the whole reason that we're in business, our core purpose is to create irrational loyalty. Like when we create irrational loyalty, we elevate brands. That's good for business. Healthy businesses make healthy economies, healthy economies make healthy people. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why we're in this. I'm on a million brand mission. Personally, my business is part of the way that I fulfill that mission, writing books, doing interviews, speaking. That's another way that I fulfill that mission. But when I remember, I'm like, why am I doing this? It's always a good reminder. I also remind myself of what are our core values. Yes, and we do hard things. Be the CEO of your own desk. A win for one is a win for all. Use your magic, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, that's how we operate. That's the lens that we operate through as a brand. Now, the question that we ask our customers is how can we be indispensable to you at this time, right? Knowing that my goal is to elevate your business through branding, I ask the question, how can I be indispensable to you at this time? That means what I've been doing, I've, I've been generously like consulting with businesses who are struggling with their pivot or they're trying to figure out like, what should I be saying? How, how should I go to market? How should I engage with companies and things like that? Let me tell you, I've given more things away for free over the past eight weeks than maybe the sum total of my entire 30 plus year career. I have generated more new business in the last couple of weeks than maybe the previous year before. What do I mean by new business? I mean, new accounts, new people in my community. I've grown the size of my own community exponentially just by giving it away. So, so what brands can be doing now is like, remind yourself, why do we do what we do? Why are we in this business? Why have I chosen this path? Not, not to make money for myself, but it, you know, through the lens of how am I helping other people, right? And then ask the question of how can I be dispensable? to my customers at this time. And then if you don't know, like I can't figure out how to be indispensable to my customers at this time, like go and freaking ask them, what can I do for you? Knowing that my special gifts and my special talents are this, and these are the things that we do, what can I do for you? Or even 
package up an offer, create something and say, you know what, you are my valued customer and right now I'm really trying to take care of my community. So without obligation, I wanna offer you these three things that I'm doing for my existing clients. You don't have to avail yourself of any of those things, but I wanna give you these things, right? That is powerful. That's what brands can be doing right now. And then your second question, what was your second question was? As far as your, your, your staff, your team, what uh, the conversations you're having with them? Okay, so um, I, this is really interesting. I came across yesterday as I was just doing my daily reading of the news, the text of the email that Brian Chesky, the founder and CEO of Airbnb, sent to his employees. They laid off 1,900 people yesterday. I don't know if you if you heard this. No. Um, Chesky wrote an email that I will tell you is like a masterclass in leadership communication. And um, I recommend everybody who's watching this, like go find it. It's actually posted on the Airbnb blog. So if you just go to the Airbnb blog, it's like, you know, Brian's, Brian's email to his entire employee base. And, and it like a strategic masterclass in leadership. It, so here are the characteristics. It was, it was vulnerable. It was courageous. It was, it was filled with gratitude. It was transparent. It was open. Um, it, it, he showed his sadness and disappointment and his appreciation for people. Because the biggest thing that we can do as leaders of our brand right now is communicate in a way that inspires confidence and makes people want to continue to engage. Right. And so at the beginning of this whole thing, uh, we doubled down on the amount of team communication that we do. So like as a team, we always have a daily huddle at 9, 12 a.m. We moved our huddle to Zoom. We usually do it in person when we're in the office. Um, but we moved our huddle online and we still do the daily huddle at 9, 12 a.m. 9, 12 a.m. We get together. This is how it goes. Every single person reports, here's what I did yesterday. Here's what's up today. Then we do a round of here's my top priority today. And then we have a round, which we added long before this, but we had a round of gratitude. We asked the question, what are you grateful for today? Really, really important that we have this daily touch point. We are redrawing the, the neural pathways in our brains with gratitude. We're drowning out the itty bitty shitty committee by replacing yes. it with gratitude, right? Yes. And, and, and that gratitude, some days the gratitude, like my father had heart surgery yesterday. This morning, my gratitude is, I, I am grateful that my dad is still alive because he had a six hour heart surgery yesterday in the middle of COVID, right? One of the gratitudes on my team was, this morning I'm grateful for coffee, mm -hmm. right? And so, you get a real understanding of what's going on in people's lives, but they get the opportunity to like drown out the badness with something that they're grateful for. So, so that gratitude round has been really helpful. The additional thing that we did when I saw that some of my team members were struggling is that we added a touch point at the end of the day, which is called uh, sanity hour. Yeah. <laughs> sanity hour like it originally started out it was like a happy hour and then I was like we don't need to be drinking at 4 15 in the afternoon but it's it's sanity <laughs> hour and so during sanity hour that's just time to check in and socialize and have the water cooler conversation and what are you up to how was your day what's going on I also send every week I send a surprise gift to my team one of the things I sent out a couple of weeks ago is this uh -oh. coloring book it just surprised it showed up at everybody's house. I sent that with some drawing uh, coloring pencils and every single person had to pick one of these things out of the book and color it. And we did an art show this Friday. Let me see if I can find what's this Friday. I had it oh right. Oh my here. goodness. So this Friday, we're do oh, here we go. I sent this to everybody, which this is sort of like, it, it's sort of like Play-Doh, but it doesn't smell as bad. It's a, it's like a modeling clay. And so this Friday, and we do, we do sanity hour every day, but like the little surprise happens on Fridays. Yeah. So this Friday, everybody has to make a sculpture and we have a special guest who's one of our clients who's going to come in and judge our sculpture contest. The only rule is you can't make genitals. <laughs> and 
Last Friday, we had like a pop-up team building activity where a friend of mine who owns a team building company came in and ran like a real quick experience for us where we divided the company into multiple teams. Every team got the plot of a very, very well-known movie. So we had The Wizard of Oz, Titanic, Beauty and the Beast, and they had to act the whole thing out on Zoom using only things that they could find in their houses. It was one of the most hilarious things. So, so really like, you know, when, when you ask the question of like, how should leaders be communicating? Leaders yeah. should be like, A, remember I said, like in the absence of information, people make up the most terrifying ideas on their own, right? Yeah. You, you should be communicating with precision and you should be communicating frequently, right? And you should be communicating, like the lesson that I learned from Brian Chesky's email is you should be communicating authentically. And, it, you know, I'm going to tuck that email away, just like if you've read Irrational Loyalty, I, I actually do a reprint of the, of the letter that Kevin Johnson, who was the CEO of Starbucks, the letter that he sent to the public after what happened in Philadelphia, where, you know, where they called the police on those two guys who were just having a meeting in the store. Um, you know, but I, I, I am saving that as sort of a model of like excellent leadership communication. So it's authentic, it's courageous, it's vulnerable, it's open, it's precise. The other thing is as leaders, we sometimes don't know, like we don't know the answer, we don't know the answers, right? There was a period where I spent, I spent every minute of two weeks like applying for that freaking PPP loan for the company. A lot of my colleagues, like other entrepreneurs and CEOs, they were like, are you telling your team? I was like, hell yeah, I'm telling my team. Like, I want them to know what I'm going through. I want them to know the lengths that I am willing to go to in order to create a space so that they can continue to do meaningful work. Even though I got the PPP loan in the second round, I still had to let some people go. And, um, it, you know, that's one of the saddest things that people have to deal with because it was money that I received that was too little too late. I don't know that I'll be able to use it all up. I might have to give some of it back and, and things like that. I still had to let people go because I just couldn't make the numbers work. The conversation that I have with my team is I still couldn't make the numbers work, right? right. I want to tell you, I deeply appreciate all of you. And so one of, one of the employees, uh, of, you know, it, it's, personally heartbreaking to me because he's one of my favorites and and I raised him from an egg but I you know I have to transition him out of his role but I'm doing it in a really really uh, you know I think like a very mature and classy way so that so that everybody can maintain their dignity and we've just been very open about the conversation now is not the time to hide things I, there are other people, like I hear other entrepreneurs, they're arguing with me about this. They're like, the company doesn't, doesn't need to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Like, I am a person, I am just a big beating heart. Not everybody is like me, <laughs> but it's, it's better for me to just be authentic with people in my communication. I'm a better leader if I'm just true to who I am. They all know that I'm an emotional mess most of the time, right? <laughs> That's why I have someone who works for me, who I alternate between wanting to punch him in the throat and hug him because, you know, he prevents me from like getting too emotional. I love that. I love, I love just your, your honesty, your transparency and all of this. It's so appreciated. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I think we're over our time too. We are, my goodness. So to bring this back home, full circle, um, two more questions. All right. What do you want to leave us with? The takeaways. The takeaways. Um, I, I think the takeaways are, uh, the main takeaway is like you have a brand whether you like it or not and you should take control of it. The best way to take control of it is, is to do four things. First is figure out who is your ideal customer. Who is the customer who is most highly predictive of your success? If you knew who that person was before, you need to ask yourself, how is that person different today? So that's the first thing. The second thing, you need to become part of that person. Use your brand as a magnet to attract that person using your values and beliefs. Like aim your magnet directly at their values and beliefs and bring those two things together. Their values and beliefs, your values and beliefs, and bring them to your brand so that the brand becomes part of them. And then answer these three questions, which are the first one is, what does it say about that person that they use your brand? 
And that sort of describes like what, you know, the things like, what do you know about me that I drive a Ford F-150 truck, right? Like you make up a story in your mind about that. So we call those the self-expressive benefits of brand. The second thing is answer the question of, seriously, Tess, am I? I am almost done. All right. You answer the question of, what is the one thing that people get from my brand that they can't get from anyone else's? This speaks to your uniqueness, the you-ness of your brand. You guys right now on this call have experienced some of the you-ness of Brandy and some of the you-ness of me. Like I, I'm an acquired taste, I know, right? But Brandy is a person who like who brings sunshine into every interaction. You can't help but feeling energized and inspired and uplifted by Brandy. That is the brandiness of Brandy's brand, right? Thank you. Say that ten times fast. <laughs> but like, figure out like the like what is the unique and singular thing that is ownable by you that no one else can imitate, right? Okay. And then the third question, which this is the sex question, just to bring that full circle. The, this this question is how does your brand make your customer the hero in their own story right yeah. the hero always gets the girl or gets the guy at the end of the day they're the ones who get to take the role in the hay role in the hay right yes that's, you know that's how branding is like sex so that's that's the big takeaway and 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 now is the time if you've already done this work now is the time to relook at it because we've all changed absolutely Oh, so good. <laughs> All right. My final question. And I, I, right. I pretty much already know the answer to this, but you might surprise me. <laughs> okay. You know what? You just threw down the gauntlet. <laughs> I hope I do surprise you. See, now I'm like, what is this question? Well, this is the Passionpreneur series. So have you found your passion? Duh. <laughs> I knew it. I knew yeah. it. <laughs> no, th this, this is my passion. I can't not do it. I, I, when I say that I'm the John Wooden of branding, like I, I literally can't not do it. Uh, one of my team members, Tom, who you met when we started talking about this, he, he, he's like, it's a compulsion for her. You know, I'm, I am compelled to share. This is my passion. Uh, I've been very fortunate that my passion is my work. And that I, I not only have been able to build like a really good successful company doing that, but I also have my own personal creative pursuits attached to it. So I get to write books, I get to speak, I get to do media, I get to do fun things like this. Uh, I get to share that passion all over the place. Because um, my passion is, I'm on that million brand mission, which I, I will... I. I will know that I made my dent in this big world when I see lots of people out there who are figuring out who their ideal customer is and, and they're answering those brand questions and they're elevating their businesses through brand. So yeah, I found it. I also really like skiing and apparently dogs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Deb, you are amazing. Thank you so much. For all Thank of this, my, my, my paper is full of notes. <laughs> nice, nice. Do you share these notes with your, with your viewers? I will actually, yes. After this interview, they will all receive an email with information from you as far as how to stay in contact with you, um, links to your books to purchase, and then um, just ways to get to know you better. Yay. Well, I'm doing the webinars. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the webinars. So they're like webinars, but they're hosted by me. So they're webinars, trademark, void where prohibited. Um, <laughs> I have, yeah. Uh, so, so I have a, I, I have a thing. This is a new thing. It's called Brand New World. Surprise! Called Brand New World, and and basically, it's sort of like a podcast, but it's on video. Their conversation is kind of like what Brandy and I are having, except for. Um, I, you know, I, I am not as good an interviewer as she is and they are on topics like about business and about leadership and about branding and about marketing and about finance. And, uh, we have done between the public sessions and private sessions that I've done for other organizations since March, we've done about 40 of these and wow. many of the most popular episodes are posted on the debgabor.com website if people want to go watch them. You watch them for free. We always have like digital downloads, worksheets, workbooks, free things. Like go get them. You're not going to get dumped into some kind of sales funnel. 
like when I said that you have to do things through a lens of helping versus selling, yeah. you know, this is how I'm helping. I'm sharing this information and I'm fortunate. I told you guys, I have a big life. I know lots of really, really well-known authors and speakers and thought leaders and stuff like that. And those people are coming to me now and they're like, can I be on a webinar? And so it's really cool. I get to, I get to share that with other people. So, so that's one of the ways that I'm giving back to a community that's been really generous to me. So I hope people take advantage of that. Absolutely. I'll make sure to include a link directly to that as well. And awesome. then all of the little tidbits and notes and nuggets of gold you've given us <laughs> today. Yes, right on. <laughs> Very good. Deb, thank you so much again for your time and your, your wisdom, everything. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. This was really fun and good luck with this project. I, I hope that I, I hope this goes well for you. Like I, you're putting great content out into the world. So yeah. Thank you. It's all good. Thank you. Thank it's, you. It's all hard and just like you said, wanting to give and share. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Well, I'll say it has, as I end everything, like wash your hands, don't touch your face, make sure you schedule a little bit of time for fun, you know, take care of yourself, take care of each other, stay healthy. Um, keep that smile. You have the best smile of anybody I've talked to in this whole, oh this my whole goodness. COVID thing. You can't, can't not be happy being around Brandy, right? <laughs> Thank you, my dear. Okay. You're awesome. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You guys stay tuned. We have so much more coming toward toward you to you and definitely be on the lookout for the email with all of Deb's info and stay connected. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you soon.